Here we're going to take a quick look at three ways to calculate average returns for investments. The first is an arithmetic average return, which is by far the simplest, but also least effective way to calculate average returns. The next is going to be a geometric average, or sometimes called a time-weighted average return. It's much better than arithmetic, but it also can be affected by how much we're putting in and be a little bit misleading. The best way is probably the dollar-weighted average, which takes into account not just the compounding effect, but when we receive those returns. So I'm going to walk through an example to illustrate the three different methods for calculating returns. We're going to start with the arithmetic average. The arithmetic average just looks at the average rate of return, how we would normally calculate an average, which is just add up the values and divide by the number of observations. Now before we do that though, I want you to notice that both sets of returns here are exactly the same, it's just the sequence is different. So in the first set, we've got negative 20, negative 30, 15, 35, and 20. And in the second set, we've just flipped the order around. So now the 20 is the first, 35 is the second, and our last return is the negative 20. So these are the same sets of numbers. They're just ordered a bit differently. And that's going to make a difference when we get to our dollar-weighted return. I remember the arithmetic average, we just add them up and divide by the number of observations. So I take negative 20 plus a negative 30 plus a 15 plus 35 plus 20. There are five years, so I divide by five. In Excel, I can do that equal sum, which just adds up those values and divides by five. Alternatively, Excel has a function called average, which does that for me. I just highlight the columns, take an average. And you can see it's doing the same thing. It's giving me the same answer. Now, geometric takes into account compounding. The way to think of this is that a 100% gain does not get offset by a 100% loss. Instead, a 100% gain actually gets offset by a 50% loss. So if I start with a dollar and have a 100% gain, I now have doubled my money to $2. And then if I have a 50% loss, I'm back down to $1. So effectively, I'm where I started. I don't have any return at all. But with this arithmetic average that I used, it would say 100 plus negative 50 divided by 2, and it would say I have a 25% average annual return. So you can tell that's not very realistic. So what I want to do here is set up a formula where I'm taking 1 plus the return times 1 plus the return times 1 plus the return for every year. And then because there are five years, I want to take the fifth root of that. If there were four years, I'd take the fourth root. If there were 15 years, I would take the 15th root and then subtract off one. Well, that's a little bit more complicated, but let me walk through how to set that up in Excel. I want to take one plus that first period return times one plus that second period return times one plus that third period return times one plus fourth period return. And finally, because there are five years, one plus the fifth period return. Now I want to take all of that to the one fifth power. So I'm going to put another parenthesis out front right here. And I'm going to put a parenthesis at the end. And then I'm going to raise that to the one-fifth power. Remember, the five there is because there are five years. So however many years I have, that's the nth root that I'm taking. Now once I've got that, I subtract off one, and that's going to give me my geometric average return. Notice it's quite a bit lower than my arithmetic, and that's because this 
20% positive or negative return in year one is not offset by a 20% positive return in year five. Instead, it takes me more than 20% to get back to even. So when I look into compounding, geometric average is always going to be a little bit lower, or in some cases a lot lower, than the arithmetic average. Now I'm just moving this formula over to do D. Note again, it doesn't matter the order of the sequence of returns, my arithmetic average is the same. Now the last one is the dollar weight of return, and that's a little bit more complicated. What we've got to do is actually calculate the future value. How much did we start with? How much have we added? And then how much do we end up with? And from there, calculate our rate of return. So let's walk through that. I start with $10,000. and I lost 20% that year, so I multiply that by one plus the rate of return. That tells me how much I have at the end of the year before I add my 4,000, so now I'm gonna add that 4,000 per year to that. Now I go to year two. Now with year two, I didn't start with 10,000, I started with the 12,000 that I had at the end of year one. So now my formula is going to be E5, that value I had at the end of year one, times one plus my year two return. That's gonna get me to the end of the year, and then I'm gonna add 4,000 again. Then I'm gonna go to year three. I start year three with the amount I had at the end of the previous year, this 12,400. Oops, it's 86. I multiply by one plus the return. I've got a 15% return. And then I add in my 4,000 at the end. Keep going with this process. So year four, I start with my $18,260. I multiply by one plus my 35% return, and then I add in my 4,000. And then finally with year five, same thing again. I start with my $28,651. That's in E8. Multiply by one plus my return. That's in C9 and then add in my $4,000. So I started the year with 10,000. I added $4,000 each year to that. And now I want to calculate my dollar weighted return. So in order to do that, I want to go to a time value of money function called rate. Rate returns the interest rate per period of a loan or investment. So in this case, I've got an investment I've got a five-year time horizon. So the first thing I put in, you can see down here, is the number of periods. It's five. Next, I put in my payment. How much have I been contributing each year? Now, Excel, like a financial calculator, wants to balance things out. So I've been giving up 4,000. I want to make that negative. How much did I give up to start with? That's my present value, you can see here. I gave up 10,000. And now I need my future value, which is going to be this 38,381. So now I can calculate my rate of return. That's 8.19%. Now I'm going to do the same thing over here. Now notice, because I had higher returns early on, by the end of year two, I was well ahead in this second set of returns but then I had negative returns at the end, so I ended up worse off at the end of the five years. So now I calculate again my geometric rate. Let's go through that again, it's five years. I put in 4,000 each year. I started with 10,000, but now 
I had $25,926.40 at the end, that gave me a rate of negative 4.88%. Notice my arithmetic average was the same, my geometric average was the same, but in scenario one, I actually made a little over 8%. In scenario two, I lost almost 5% a year. And that's because of the compounding. In scenario one, by the time I had my 35 and 20% returns, I'd build up a higher value, and that was benefiting from those higher returns. In scenario two, my last two years were negative. Unfortunately, I had more money to get hit by that, and so that was more costly. So the sequence of returns makes a big difference as well as the actual returns themselves. Now, dollar-weighted return is what you're going to actually recognize in an investment over a long time period. So if you're adding money to a mutual fund over a 20 or 30 or 40 year time horizon, what you'd actually like to happen is have relatively weaker returns early on and strong returns near the end of that time horizon. That would be much better for you than to have strong returns early on and weak returns at the end of your time horizon. That wraps up our video on arithmetic average, geometric average, and dollar weighted averages as far as calculating returns. Thank you.